For this short little video, we're going to talk about the SI system. Now, this is something you probably haven't heard about uh, if you haven't been in any kind of chemistry class in the past, maybe physics. The SI system is kind of the evolution of the metric system. This is a decimalized system of measurements that was developed to replace the old standard English system, which is what we in the United States still use. The problem with the English system has always been a couple of, couple of big problems, but the major problem for most students is that every conversion factor in the English system, the standard system we use, is unique. So it's you know 12 inches to a foot, it's 3 feet to a yard, it's 5,280 feet to a mile. You know, there's a specific one for rods per furlong and stuff like that. The metric system and now the SI system was an attempt to standardize all these measurements, to take them down to one base unit. And the kind of quintessential base unit in humans is 10 because we have 10 fingers. So everything is base 10 in the SI system. Now the SI system has seven base units. These are the descriptions of reality the mathematical descriptors of reality. Okay? The seven units, and you can see them around the inner group here, the inner, it should be a heptagon, in the middle here, starting at the 12 o'clock position, S, that's second. Then going clockwise, we go to kg, which is kilogram, mol, which is mole, which is probably one you haven't heard about before if you've never taken chemistry. Down to CD. Now, CD is one we're not going to use. That's a candela. It's a measure of luminosity, how bright something is. Going over to the capital K, which is Kelvin. That's a measure of temperature, which we'll talk about in a moment. Going up to the capital A. Now, that stands for ampere, which is a measure of current. And then M for meter. So these are the seven immutable units of the SI system, and they are linked to constants of reality. Now, this has not always been true. Uh, used to be that these were like the standard English system based on some weird archaic standard value. Uh, back in the day, the foot used to be defined as the length of the monarch's foot. But nowadays, they are defined by immutable values. We're going to talk about a few of those as we move forward. So let's talk about the units that are relevant to chemistry. Okay. First is the kilogram. That's the SI unit of mass. Now, students sometimes ask me, why is the kilogram the unit of mass? Because I remember enough about the metric system to remember that kilogram means a thousand grams. So why isn't gram the base unit? Well, it has to deal with accuracy. Remember, when they were creating this system, it was way before the tools that we have now. This is like the 1700s is when they created the original metric system. So they had to be able to measure whatever the standard was very, very accurately. And a gram is just too small to do that with the old uh, tools they had. So they standardized it to a kilogram, which was a sizable mass. Now, originally, it was standardized to the mass of one liter of water. Then they standardized it to an immutable iridium platinum uh, cylinder, which is what you see in the picture on the slide. Now, the problem is, if you look at that cylinder, it's under two vacuum jars, actually three, there's another one around it, three vacuum jars, and it's held in isolation, but even over the centuries of picking up and moving it the various times it's been measured, it's lost a little bit of mass enough of the minuscule number of atoms have abraded off that up to the seven or eight decimal points that these things are measured out to have disappeared that the mass is slightly lower now. So they are, they've redefined what a kilogram is based on an immutable constant uh, called Planck's constant. Now that is way beyond the scope of where we're at in this course. You got to get some deep, ugly physics to understand how Planck's constant, which is an electrical value, can be linked to a mass, but it's doable. We can say, with a good estimation, like I say on the slide, within 30 parts per million, it's still roughly equal to the mass of one liter of water. Okay. By the way, think about a question that I asked, I think on a previous slide somewhere. 
Remember, there is a difference between mass and weight. Mass is how much there is of something. Weight is how much gravity affects mass. Now, since we're all in the same gravitational field, those are the same on the surface of the planet. So your mass and your weight are the same. They're both labeled in kilograms. However, if you go to, say, the moon, your mass is still going to be a certain number of kilograms that it is here on Earth. Your weight will be different because the gravity field will be less on you. The second one is the SI unit for length. Now, the SI unit for length is the meter. Now, again, back in the day, the meter used to be a literal bar that was a certain length, and there were replicas of these bars that were all over the place, and that was, you know, the standard meter. But we have since, and this was quite a while ago, redefined what a meter is based on the speed of light. So we look at how far light travels, a photon of light travels, in a vacuum in a set period of time. Now, it's approximately one three hundred thousandth of a second. You're like, uh, okay, <laughs> right? But that was the value to get it as close as they could to the original standard meter that they developed originally, all right? Roughly longer than a yard, okay? Little, a few more inches than a yard, if you want to think about it in terms of English units. Now note, we are only going to be using metric units throughout this course. If I ever give you an English to metric conversion, I would give you the conversion factor to go between the two of you. But I expect you to be able to convert between metric units, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Now the second is the SI unit for time. Now note, the second is what they use. And if you talk about scientific terminology, they'll talk about milliseconds and kiloseconds and stuff like that. And you're like, well, what about minutes and hours? They're accepted units in science. We will talk about hours, we'll talk about years and stuff like that, but they're very inaccurate units, right? Because as we know this year, 2020, we have a leap year. So we have one extra day in the year, and that's because the Earth goes around the sun in slightly more than 365 days, right? So minute, hour, day, year, millennia are all really inaccurate measurements. A second can be standardized. Now, the second is standardized to how many vibrations there are in a cesium-133 atom in a certain, you know, how many certain vibrations equal one second. So that's something that's immutable. Right. By the way, if you look, also uh, minutes, hours, days, those aren't base 10, are they? They're actually base 12. If you really work it out, you can work out how they're base 12. Right. They're base 12 because they go back to Babylonian times and Babylonian math was base 12 because they counted the knuckles on the four fingers and then used the thumb as a placeholder rather than counting the fingers themselves. Okay, SI unit for temperature. Now this is the one that throws people. The SI unit for temperature is the Kelvin, right? Now note, first off, there is no degree in Kelvin, it's just Kelvin. The Kelvin is um, an absolute temperature measure. Now the difference between two Kelvins, right, you know, like say going between 34 Kelvin and 35 Kelvin is the same difference in temperature as one degree Celsius. What differs between the Celsius scale and the Kelvin scale is where you put the zero. Now this is old school, right? We use the Fahrenheit scale. Now the Fahrenheit scale was designed uh, based on the kind of crude understanding of uh, temperature back at the time it was developed. So zero degrees on the Fahrenheit scale was actually linked to the freezing point of seawater. And that was because it was created in Great Britain and it was a naval power, so it was important they know what temperature seawater froze at. And 100 degrees was roughly human body temperature to the degree they could measure it, right? Celsius fine-tuned the scale. He gave it um, a little bit better basis. He put zero at the freezing point of pure water and 100 degrees at the boiling point of pure water. Pretty good. Well, Kelvin took it one step further and Kelvin scale, zero is the absolute zero, the lowest temperature you can get. In theory, at zero Kelvin, there is absolutely no motion. Hence, everything stops. 
Now, we can't get to zero Kelvin. It's impossible, but we can get really close. We can get within micro Kelvins of it. Now, how do you go between Celsius and Kelvin? Pretty straightforward. Zero degrees Celsius equals 273.15 Kelvin. So if you want to convert Celsius to Kelvin, you add 273.15. If you want to create go from Kelvin to Celsius, you subtract 273.15. Okay? We're not going to work in Fahrenheit. And the last one that's really important to us is the mole. Okay. Now the mole is it's a unit of how much of something there is. Okay? It's a unit of quantity. Now, a mole contains exactly Avogadro's number of something. Now, we're going to talk more about that in Chapter 2. But it is a very specific quantity because we have to talk about chemistry in terms of how many atoms there are, how many ions there are, or how many molecules there are not how many grams of it there is. And this is what allows us to normalize between things like grams and how many atoms we have. So, by the way, people ask me where mole comes from. It happens to be a mistranslation of a German paper. It was supposed to be molecules in the German paper, but they abbreviated it uh, to M-O-L-E, which is the German abbreviation of molecules. and a translator thought that's what they intended to call it, and so it got named the mole. Yeah, sometimes weird stuff like that happens in science. Now, I know some of you may be looking at that going, okay, it's recently redefined as exactly Avogadro's number. What's Avogadro's number? We'll come back to that in Chapter 2, okay? Now, there are other terms that we'll use. Uh, probably one of the biggest ones we'll use later in the course that we haven't introduced yet is the Pascal. All right, Pascal is a unit of pressure, but we're not going to get to that chapter eight, so I'm going to leave that until we um, <clears throat> get to it. But it does bring up an interesting thing. Pascal wasn't one of those original units we talked about. Another thing that wasn't on that original unit we talked about was anything to measure volume. Right? No, we talked about meters and we talked about kilograms, but we never talked anything about volume. And that's because that would be what we call a derived value. Right? You can get volume from measurements of length. Right? If I want to measure the volume of a rectangular solid, it's the length times the width times the height. And that's actually where you get the SI unit for volume. The SI unit for volume is meters cubed. Now, meters cubed is an absolutely huge volume. Right? One meter by one meter by one meter. So that's roughly a yard by a yard by a yard. A little bit more than that. That's a big volume, right? Bigger than your average bottle of Coke. Right? And if you think about it, wait, my average bottle of Coke is a two liter. Right. Liter is what we call an accepted value. It's not it's not linked back to a hard and fast thing, but it is accepted by the SI system. A liter is equal to a decimeter cubed. And a decimeter is one-tenth of a meter on each side. Now, we're going to get another video where we're going to talk about more of the uh, how we convert from one unit to another. So we're going to kind of polish this off here and talk about this fact that we will come back to derived units in a later talk. Now, for our next time, I want you guys to look at these. These are the prefixes of the units. We're going to come back to the slide in the next video and talk about how we convert between two units in the metric system.